let's go ahead and uh, reward all those for showing up on time, and we'll we'll get started here. We'll go ahead and uh, call this meeting to order of the Sacramento Public Library Authority on Thursday, March twenty fifth, two thousand and twenty one, at three o two p.m. It's so stupid. If uh, <laughs> <Eric>. <laughs> it's okay, it's all right, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if the clerk could please call the roll. Okay. Angelique Ashby. Bobby Singh Allen. Here. <laughs> Don Natoli. Eric Guetta. Here. Garrett Gatewood. Here. Kevin Spees. Here. My Vang. Here. Patrick Kennedy, Bill Cerna, Rich Desmond, Rick Jennings. I am here. Sean Lolloy, Sean Farmer. Here. Oh wait, Sean Lolloy is coming in now. Sue Frost. Tim Schaefer. Here. Tim Schaefer. Um, and Sean Lolloy. He's here, I see him. Sean Lolloy. Here. Thank you. And I'll read the statement. This meeting of the Sacramento Public Library Authority is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at metro14live.satcounty.net. Today's meeting will be repeated Saturday, March 27 at 4 p.m. on channel 14. The meeting will also be recorded by a Zoom. A DVD copy will be available no later than two weeks following today's meeting. The full agenda, including reports, is available on the library website at www.saclibrary.org. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should raise their hand in the Zoom program. Please speak clearly when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Comments are limited to three minutes so that everyone may be heard. Please also note that participation in this teleconference via telephone rather than the Zoom app may result in your telephone number being visible to the public during the live broadcast and later telecasts of this meeting. Great, thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, if everyone could please rise and join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, us, uh, Board Member Lilloe to lead us today. I pledge, the flag, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible and with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Board Member Lilloe. Appreciate that. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment on matters not on the agenda? We have uh, Pat Sayer Handley, president of North Sacramento Friends. Good I afternoon, believe, Pat. oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I believe Pat wanted to speak about item number, number 7.3. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, move that comment to uh, item 7.3 then. I don't Madam see Clerk, any, any other, other members? Hands. No, I don't see any. Great, and we have uh, board member Ashby who's joined us. Okay, then uh, we'll move on to uh, third item on our agenda. Our friends of the Sacramento Public Library, uh, Karen Wilson, welcome. I think you're on mute there. I was, hello. I think I'm not now, thank you. I'm Karen Wilson, president of the Friends and um, I will let you know what we're doing. So friends are going on Zoom visits for Book First uh, to help make Book First deliveries a little special. Of course, it's the children and youth specialists, librarians who are actually doing the work of connecting with the kids and we're just happy to be with them. 
they're in the classroom virtually. And we're looking forward to those in-person classroom visits as soon as we can. A book first is funded by what the friends raised on the big day of giving, which this year is May 6th. So we hope everyone will donate to the friends to make book first possible for uh, first graders in our underserved schools in the 2021-22 school year, hopefully in person. Uh, we've served many thousands of kids with their very own uh, first book to keep. And many, many times it's the only book that these kids have ever had of their own. And one day we hope to uh, again, link the kids up with their local library. So that's something that was also a goal of the program. And when they're open again, we wanna see those kids back on the kids' mats. And we'd like to give a big shout out finally to our library staff, and not just on Library Workers Day, which is April 6th, but every day. Uh, we, they make it look seamless from outside, but we've been able to peek inside those libraries and uh, to make curbside service happen, to make the computer visits happen, to keep the libraries accessible. It has taken a Herculean effort during the pandemic, and we would like to thank them and give them a big shout out. So thanks very much to our library staff and to you, our JPA board. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, President Karen uh, Wilson there for those comments. Uh, also, let me put it on to presentation 3.2, National Library Workers' Day recognition. Thank you. Um, so the American Library Association helps us all celebrate libraries by commemorating National Library Week. And part of that is to acknowledge the work that library workers in all types of libraries do, whether school libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, and of course, uh, those libraries most near and dear to my heart, public libraries. So we have a, a proclamation that we have prepared since we do not get to be, um, we have a whole thing we try to do for staff in person. So um, we have prepared a, a proclamation and uh, Chair Gara, if you would like to say a few words or read it, we would be most appreciative. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I, I wanna just thank all our library workers and the, the work that they do. Uh, it, not just in, uh, I think, you know, managing a, a significant public act, uh, asset, but, uh, but in their effort in this pandemic, what they've been able to do for uh, many of the families who have been uh, uh, in support and need of distance learning and distance education, uh, and also, uh, you know, just giving an extra hand to pull together here. So I, I'll read, uh, I think, uh, just a couple of these. You know, whereas uh, National Library Workers Day will be observed in libraries throughout the country and in Sacramento on April 6, 2020, a day of library staff to be recognized for the contributions that they make in communities across North America. And whereas Sacramento Library staff provides that library services to people of all ages and abilities that enrich support and recognize our diverse community develop new services that enhance literacy, preserve our history and support learning of all ages. Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Sacramento Public Library Board does hereby recognize the Sacramento Public Library's employees and their dedication to their jobs and the communities that they serve. So I just want to personally thank all our employees there. Uh, again, I, I recall back, uh, you know, our uh, the, the librarian and the library staff that helped uh, uh, my family as a kid. And, uh, you know, and interestingly, I ran them during this advocacy uh, a, a while back at the state capitol. So thank you for all their work. Thank you so much. I know everyone appreciates that we have great staff and working under extraordinary circumstances. Okay, great. So thank you again for all that effort. Uh, we'll, uh, um, if there are no other members of the, the board who wish to speak on this item, uh, I do want to welcome uh, our uh, supervisor, Phil Cerna. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. And, uh, and then uh, we'll move on to our executive team report here. Thank you so much. Um, I'll refer the board to the written report, but I have a couple of additions. Um, I want to just mention, please take a look at the virtual homework zone statistics. That's something that our incredible youth services team put together several months ago. and. Um, it's been going every week, and the, while the numbers aren't huge, huge, 
the response has been very enthusiastic. And I want to get a, sh a shout out to Christy Ham and all of the amazing youth services librarians who've made this possible. It's a great it's a great testament to volunteerism in our community, as well as the hard work of library staff. Um, I want to also mention that uh, we received uh, notice this week of a bequest we will be receiving in the amount of about $475,000 from an estate. We're quite thrilled about that. Uh, there are some restrictions on it, but they're all ones that we can celebrate the purchase of mystery books and programs. So we're very, very grateful to the late Carol uh, Schneider, who loved the library so much, she made us the primary beneficiary of her estate. And um, that is something also to celebrate. We also received news of a number of grants, um, a lot of them STEM related. I'm going to call on Christy Ham just to quickly mention what they are, because I think they're important for the board to hear. Good afternoon, Christy. Hi there. I'm sorry, Rip. Give me one more. I was multitasking. I bet you were. I just want you to update them very quickly on the grants. Yes. Oh, excellent. We got three grants from the State Library uh, for some summer virtual youth programming. So we are going to be doing uh, three different projects. One is upgraded uh, equipment to make our anime trivia program that's happening monthly uh, that much more exciting and look better and have better connectivity. We're going to have uh, anime providers also come speak to the kids that, that come to these things to share with them how to get into that um, uh, endeavor. Uh, we also are going to be doing a science book club for kids where we're going to give them a kit uh, and a book and walk through some STEM activities with them uh, and give them all the stuff that they need to have a successful experience. Uh, and then in addition, we're going to do something that's really exciting called Sound Connect, where we're going to do oral history uh, instruction with community providers and give youth the actual tools they'll need to make high quality recording kind of things. So help them become content creators and, and explore their own oral histories with their families. So exciting, more, more later. Thank you, Very Christy. Exciting. Yes, and I have one more thing, and this is not as much fun. Um, you know that we've been working very, very hard since the pandemic uh, began to, in to institute a number of safety protocols to reduce the spread of COVID-19. We work very closely with the county uh, health department and follow their guidance. And that includes things like being socially distanced and wearing masks at all times. And we've had a great success rate at the library. We have 26 locations right now that are currently open. They're serving the public in one way or another, through curbside, computer appointments, or browsing. But there's one location where we have experienced resistance from a partner uh, over and over over the last nine months. Um, our Franklin Library is a shared space with the Elk Grove Unified School District. And our staff and patrons are in close quarters. Uh, in that particular location. We've been working with the school district to try to address some of the issues that we, we have. We started working with them last June, sharing our very considerable safety protocols. We offered training, we provided uh, all of our operational plans, and we had many meetings to try to find common ground so that we can serve everyone safely. Despite these efforts, the safety of our staff and patrons continues to be compromised. To date, we have had to close the Franklin Library three times for a total of 35 days because our partner would not agree to follow health and safety protocols. The, interrup the interruption of service is really unacceptable to us, but we, can we cannot at the same time put staff in danger. So we will continue to move in this direction and, and close the library when we have to. It's closed as of today until we can work through this late, uh, latest issue. And we understand the shared space issues in this library. Elk Grove School District has grown by 50% since uh, we uh, in, entered into this agreement. They now have 60,000 students. We all know they're the largest school district in the in the county. Um, but we will be returning to the board with some recommendations for the future that extend beyond COVID-19 and help us all think pragmatically 
about what library service in that part of Elk Grove needs to be. I look forward to working with our two council members or two directors from the Elk Grove area and continuing to work proactively with the Elk Grove School District, but we will not put our staff in danger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rivka. I appreciate you uh, addressing the immediate situation, but also thinking about what is uh, what's the future, uh, what is the future policy here moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Board Member Singh Allen. Hi, thank you. Um, please enlist my support to help you. Um, obviously, as a former school board trustee, I know my co uh, former colleagues very well, and safety and security has always been um, on the forefront of not only the school district, but the entire um, community here in uh, the city of Elk Grove as well. So whatever I can do to assist your efforts, um, definitely let me know and we can hopefully mitigate this proactively. We hope thank so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate uh, your uh, proactiveness here. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dir uh, Director Sass here. We'll move on to uh, our next item here on the information section. Director Sass, does any, does, uh, uh, I, I'm assuming unless qu uh, board members have questions about the information section. Okay, since no, uh, no board members have questions about those items, we'll move on to our consent calendar. I'll ask for a motion from the board on the consent. Motion to move consent, member Jennings. Has been moved by board member Jennings. Is there a second? Second, Singh Allen. Uh, seconded by board member Singh Allen. Is there, Madam Clerk, is there any uh, members from the public who wish to speak on items on the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, no. we'll, I'll ask the clerk if she could please call the roll. Angelique Ashby. Yes. Bobby Singh Allen. Yes. Donna Tolley. Aye. Eric Guetta. Aye. Garrett Gatewood. Aye. Kevin Spees. Yes. Mai Vang. Yes. Patrick Kennedy. Aye. Bill Serna. Aye. Rich Desmond. Rick Jennings. Aye. Sean Lolowy. Aye. Sean Farmer. Aye. Sue Frost. Aye. Tim Schaefer. Aye. And it's unanimous with 12 members present. Great. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and move on to item 7.1 of our action items. Uh, our fiscal year 2021 mid-year budget. Uh, Johnny and Rivka. Thank you. I can't see Johnny on my screen. Is he here? There he is. Yeah, he's on mute. Oh, good. Yay, um, Johnny. I'm on the top screen, Rivka. There you are. All right, so our mid-year budget for fiscal year 2021. Thank you, um, Chair Guerra and members of the board. Um, Jared or Heather, may I have uh, the screen to share, please? Hey, Johnny, you should be able to share your screen. Excellent, thank you, sir. Um, so again, uh, this is the media budget update for fiscal year 2021. Um, as, as you know, it's been um, over a year since the COVID-19 um, pandemic and um, the major, there's still major health and social and economic concerns uh, throughout the nation and throughout the world. Um, however, there's still uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, with the recent vaccine rollout, um, the 1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief uh, bill that was passed. And um, the county of Sacramento is in the red here. So that means we can reopen with uh, limited capacity. Um, so libraries, businesses, um, schools can return back to campus learning. And one other bright side, um, Disneyland is slated to reopen April 30th. So for, for all the kids in us, um, that's a really positive and great sign. Um, so I'm gonna refer you to uh, the staff report um, 
And fortunately this year, there's not, not a whole lot of changes to the mid-year budget. Um, so I'm just gonna walk you through and highlight some of the, um, some of the minor changes. Um, so revenues as shown on exhibit A, uh, we are projecting to be at 51.3 million for um, the system-wide revenue. Um, and the approximately 540,000 is an increase from the September final budget. And this is mainly from the grants, gifts, and donations for uh, quarters one and two that had or already been adopted by the board already. Um, so as you can see on a staff report, um, the county property tax revenues uh, appear to be accurate at 27.7 million at this time. Um, so we're not recommending, recommending any changes to um, the projected revenues for uh, county property taxes. Um, since Sacramento uh, general fund contribution, um, it's uh, you know as budgeted as 12.8 uh, million. Um, of that amount, $506,000 is uh, for Measure U. Um, likewise, the city of Sacramento policy tax revenues uh, for measures X and B um, at 6.2 and uh, 2.3 million respectively. So uh, those amounts are um, on pace for um, as, as budgeted. And there's a 33,511 um, literacy grant that we are anticipating from the state. Um, so on the expenditure side, um, same thing, once we project revenues, we'll um, estimate the expenditure for the budget as well too. So 33,500 for the expenditure budget for the um, literacy grant as well. Um, summer reading, um, we're, we're anticipating to spend approximately 100,000 for um, this year's summer reading, and that will be covered by uh, budget savings. Um, so supplemental fund allocation, um, this is, this is um, the, you know, just a quick history. The board had approved a fund balance reserve policy back in 2019. And um, the policy called for a 35% economic uncertainty and cash flow reserve for the county fund. Um, so once we take a look, at it, also the policy required that we meet with the Finance Advisory Committee um, to go through the audited financial statements, um, to take a look at the fund balance and see if there's any supplemental funding allocation that could be allocated to um, the five county cities and unincorporated areas of the county. Um, so we looked at the fund balance at June 30th, uh, 2020. Um, it was at 24.1 million. So this number right here on table number one. Um, so once we reduce that amount by the cash flow and economic uncertainty reserve of 35 million, I mean 35 percent, um, that's 11.1 million, and restricted reserves of 1.3 million. Uh, we also looked at the five-year forecast for any structural deficits and future needs. Um, so that amount came out to 6.6 .6 million. Um, also, part of the reserve policy required that we looked at system-wide improvement and equipment uh, for security systems, um, IT needs, AMHS machines. Um, so AMHS is automated material handling system machines. Um, these are for um, processing books and also furniture and fixtures throughout the library system. Um, so once we looked at the fund balance and determined that um, you know the reserve needs minus these um, future needs, we have about 2.1 million in allocable fund balance. And looking at table number two, so out of that 2.1 million, um, the JPA agreement call for um, you know, three bases to allocate the supplemental funds. So these are property taxes, circulation percentage and population. And so the average of those supplemental factors are, um, you know, it's what we would use to allocate the 2.1 million. So of, of the 2.1 million based on uh, the supplemental funding factor, um, our return will get uh, 800, 8,190, uh, city of goals at 63,000. 
uh, Cedar, Cedar Citrus Heights at 158,000, Elk Grove 386,000, uh, Rancho Cordova 200, approximately 206,000, and 1.3 for the un unincorporated areas of the county. Um, as you'll recall, for um, members that had been on the board in previous years, uh, we have an existing supplemental fund balance. Um, so this column right here at June 30, 2020, of 386,000 combined. So once we allocate um, the 50 year 21 amount plus the prior year balances, the cumulative total will be in the last column on the right hand side. So um, again, our turn would be um, a little bit over $10,000 um, and then going down the list to un unincorporated county at 1.5 million, giving us a total of 2.5 five million uh, cumulative total uh, supplemental fund. Um, again, the Finance Advisory Committee looked at the numbers um, and looking at the uh, property tax forecast, um, they feel confident that we could recommend and staff also recommend that we allocate uh, the 2.1 million in supplemental fund to um, the five county city agencies. So Alton, Gulf, Citrus Heights, Elk Grove, Rancho, Cordova, and unincorporated areas. Um, and also keep in mind that these allocations, um, it's simply moving a unrestricted fund balance into a committed fund balance. Um, so based on GASB 54, um, we're simply moving a, an unrestricted fund to a restricted fund balance to earmark that money for, um, for the five, um, cities and the county. So um, we're not cutting any checks or wiring any money to any um, you know, cities or agencies. Um, and then position control, um, you know, we're not recommending any changes at this time. Um, and then staff are working on fiscal year 2022 budget. Um, so looking at revenues, uh, forecasting and uh, getting in touch with the, the county assessor to determine property taxes and so on. So um, that's coming up and uh, we'll be working on closing fiscal year 2021 in, uh, in about three months. Uh, so that, that concludes my report. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy, happy to answer them. Great, uh, we have a question from Sue here. Sue's, is that Sue Frost? Yes, hi Eric. I'm sorry, I had trouble with my computer today. So I'm on my iPad. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the supplemental funding. Uh, I I wonder. So what you're what you're saying is that the uh, finance committee felt that we could authorize the designation of the supplemental funding into the into the different accounts, and then what if that happens? That's just money that's still there. You're not you're allocating it, but you're not we're not spending it. And but what can they for the benefit of all the new board members? What can they use that money toward um, once it's allocated to their jurisdiction? Thank you, Director Frost. Um, you want me to answer that, Johnny? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so um, uh, that's a great question, uh, Director Frost, and I, I'm going to use Elk Grove as the example since the city is um, uh, has moved ahead with the purchase of the, the Rite Aid building farther down Elk Grove Boulevard. There's uh, a fair bit of supplemental funding in there that can actually help us get that project on the road um, because it benefits its enhanced library services, which is the purpose of supplemental funding. So that's that's what we plan. Johnny probably has a better way to answer it. Mine isn't particularly elegant, but it, um, it demonstrates both the purpose of why we have supplemental funding and what can be used for it, what it can be used for, sorry. Yeah, Rip, yeah. Uh, if, I, if I can add to that. Please. Um, Yes, yeah, so the supplemental funding, it's, um, it, it's earmarked for any library um, needs. So it could be for expanded hours, um, could be for collections, and as Rifkin mentioned, um, it could be for capital needs. 
Um, so this this would be a source that could go to the the elk grove, elk grove um, uh, you know facility purchase or construction, um, and then any um, you know maintenance or repairs that would be needed at the library as well too. So um, again, these monies are it'll be committed, um, but the money does not go away until we uh, work with the county or um, each respective agencies to uh, come up with a plan to spend the money. So it, it, it's going to be um, retaining a you know, library fund balance until we, um, or until the board decides to um, you know, spend the money. And and Johnny, at one point we were we weren't sure we were going to distribute the supplemental funding this year because we were concerned about the possibility of shortages on on the city side and possible you know need for reserves for the entire system. And so, if for some reason we did run into those situations, then it would just be a matter of each jurisdiction putting money back in whatever their percentage is to help um, satisfy whatever the situation is at the, at that time. Is that correct? Um, yes, director Frost. Um, we, so initially when we talked about uh, supplemental funding allocation um, a, a year ago, when the pandemic first started, um, our conversation was that, Hey, we don't want to allocate yet uh, due to, uncertainties in the future and the housing market, real estate, and so forth. Um, but with the year end, um, and then looking at the local real estate uh, market, um, you know, homes are selling like, you know, homes are selling like hotcakes and, you know, uh, listings are being, uh, there's, you know, hundreds of uh, uh, offers at times for, you know, local listings. So um, the, Property values are stable from what we're seeing, um, and it also checking with um, the county assessor. Um, there's really no downtrend yet, um, but you know, with that said, we still we still want to be cautious with what we do with our fund balances. Um, and and again, this is just uh, moving funds from a unrestricted fund balance into a uh, committed fund balance um, for future. Um, you know, library, you know, services and needs. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Um, uh, is there any questions on the, uh, from the staff report here from other members? If not, then we'll, let me go to the clerk and ask to see if there are members from the public who wish to comment on this item. I don't see any hands raised other than Sue's. <clears throat> Great. All right. Then I'll ask for a, um, uh, uh, Sue, do you mind just, there you go. Thank you very much. I'll take a, a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. It's been moved by Vice Chair Gatewood. Is there a second? Second by Frost. Frost. It's been seconded by uh, Board Member Frost here, Supervisor Frost. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Angelique Ashby. Yes. Bobby Singh Allen. Yes. Eric Guerra. Aye. Garrett Gatewood. Yes. Kevin Spees. Yes. Mike Bang. Yes. Patrick Kennedy. Aye. Bill Serna. Aye. Rick Jennings. Aye. Sean Lolloy. Aye. Sean Farmer. Aye. Sue Frost. Aye. Tim Schaefer. Aye. Saul Hernandez. Aye. And that's and with 15 members present. Donna Tolley, aye. Oh, Donna Tolley. Sorry. Okay. Donna's with 15 members present. Great. Thank you very much. And then uh, 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 Director Sass, I think we missed a person on the consent calendar as well. Yes, we did. I'm, I'm sorry for that um, because we knew he's here. Saul Her Hernandez, the uh, uh, alternate for uh, Supervisor Rick Desmond, uh, was here and planned to vote yes on the consent calendar. So I just want to uh, make sure that that's in the record. 
very much. Thank you, and, Saul, for and Sharon, our, our director Natoli. We would never ever overlook you. You're too well, important okay. to all of us. <laughs> Only we needed a vote. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank okay. you. Okay, got me. it. Thanks. Excuse me, uh, Chair Guerra. Um, I, I don't know if my if I could be heard on the consent. I was trying to get in. I was in on my phone for a while in this meeting, but I'm an eye on consent as well. Yes, Two I think. We, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was 15 members too. Likewise. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, board member uh, board member Frost. And uh, so. We're, now that we're all squared away on all the votes, we'll move on to item 7.2. Item 7.2, appointment of budget audit committee, fiscal year 2021 to 22. And uh, director or chair Guerra, this is this is all, all on you and all on <laughs> library staff. We had so many changes um, with the new year and six new board members that we, um, we probably should have done this in, in the January meeting, but we were trying to separate the, the appointment of the budget, budget audit committee. So yeah. we need to do that now. We, we have current members that we hope will carry over. That's you as chair, Sue Frost as immediate past chair, and Garrett Gatewood as uh, vice chair. And then you need to appoint two additional members as well as an alternate so that we can retain our um, quorum when we when we need to call upon all of you. Great. Thank you very much. I want to make sure we have some uh, some regional representation. So I think uh, we uh, it'd be great to have someone from Galt, uh, someone from the other, uh, I mean, uh, Galt from Elk Grove and someone from the other parts of the unincorporated area. Are there any any takers? We need two plus an alternate. Kevin, this has got your name all over it. You're, I'm going to nominate my colleague. <laughs> yes, I was going to wonder who's, who's thumb wrestling for this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> all right. Well, we're, we're going to nominate. numbers and runs a small business and is great with finances. Great. So we've got one down. Kevin, okay. Do we have another taker here? If not, no. Okay. If not, we're going to, we're, I'm going to uh, point uh, someone here. How about, uh, Board member Vang, how about, uh, well, let me see. Is there a name from another of the other cities that wish to be on? Not that I'm going to appoint uh, board member Vang here. How's, how are you, uh, board member Vang? Are you interested in joining on the budget circle here? Absolutely. I just was waiting patiently because I didn't know if we were just looking for the regional piece, but I would love yeah. to serve on the committee. So absolutely. Great, great. Uh, all right there. And then uh, how about uh, if we can, uh, do we have another alternate from the county there as an alternate? And uh, then I'm I'm gonna look over. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, pick on. Uh, let's see, we're gonna pick on uh, Supervisor Cerno over here. You know, as an alternate. Okay, as long as uh, my duties aren't gonna uh, be uh, too too uh, rigorous, um, <laughs> I do I do have the uh, built-in carb conflict with this meeting. So this is one of the few library authority meetings I've actually been able to participate in a while because of that. But that's, um, that's, I'll that's do my true. best to, to be a uh, dutiful alternate. We'll keep you as an alternate. We'll only need you when we can get quorum. So, thank you. Well, thank you for filling that. Great. So now that we have uh, uh, both uh, Kevin and Mai there, let, I'll ask for a motion to approve the uh, five members of the Budget and Audit Committee. Sing Allen, so moved. It's been moved by uh, Board Member Sing Allen. Is there a second? Frost, second. second. So, uh, seconded by Frost. Uh, Madam Clerk, any comments? From the public? Nope. All right. Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Angelique Ashby? Yes. Bobby Singh Allen? Yes. Anna Tolley? Aye. Eric Guetta? Aye. Garrett Gatewood? Aye. Kevin Spees? Dane? My Vang? Uh, yes. Patrick Kennedy? Aye. Phil Cerna? Aye. Rick Jennings? It's an enthusiastic yes. Sean Lolloy? Yes. Sean Farmer? Aye. Sue Frost? Aye. Tim Schaefer? Yes. Saul Hernandez? Aye. 
And that's unanimous with 15 members present. Great. Thank you. That motion carries. Appreciate that. Okay. I'll listen now to our last action item of the day, item 7.3. Uh, Director Sass. That's excuse me. Up. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, excuse me, um, Chair Guerra. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I didn't hear Ga Garrett Gatewood's name, and he was in the budget audit committee this last week when we came as vice chair. I wasn't sure if he was in that committee also. I didn't hear his yes. name. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Okay, I'm in you. it. Oh, I'm in it. Oh, <laughs> I didn't no, want no, you no. to win it. You can't get away. Oh, I'm I didn't, in it. Uh -huh. didn't want you to be left out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he's not um, going anywhere. As, here, so. as vice chair, it would be good for him to be in it to understand the budget because the library budget's a little bit different. <laughs> Very thank much you. so. We like to call it a special snowflake. Um, I just want to confirm, <laughs> uh, Director Spees, did you ab abstain? That's correct, I did. Okay, I thank you. I, I wasn't sure, oh, I wasn't sure I heard that correctly. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, item 7.3, um, because we have six new members and because, again, understanding how the JPA works and how it interacts with the, um, the jurisdictions, uh, we're doing a very, what we hope is a brief presentation to kind of update you. And, and Jared's, I think, getting ready to, to pull that up. Um, I want to update you on, on the complexities of being a JPA when it comes to running a library. We're pretty unique. There aren't very many of us. And, uh, and then we do have an action item. We're asking you to approve resolution 2113, which would authorize the operation of an expanded North Sacramento Hagenwood library should the city of Sacramento elect to purchase uh, or uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the resolution itself is um, to uh, authorize the operation of an expanded North Sac uh, Sacramento Hagenwood Library. So should the city of Sacramento elect to purchase a new building? So, um, and I know there are a lot of, um, th there th we've received a lot of um, emails regarding a specific building, but we kept it general because we have to do our timing relates to how the city does their work or how any jurisdiction would. And I wanna also explain, we did not come forward with the Elk Grove situation because there is no change in staffing anticipated for that. Um, because, of, well, I'll let Jared start the presentation. Sure. He'll explain right. everything. Well, thank you, Jared. Let's uh, take it away. Do my best here. All right, can everybody see my screen? Excellent. Okay, everybody, Very thank you um, for allowing me to present a facilities workshop. I'm hoping this is first for many in the future. So um, on our next four hour adventure, no, that's a joke, it's going to be about 10, 15 minutes. Um, we're going to kind of do a little bit of overview of facilities and talk about responsibilities as it relates to the JPA. Look at system wide square footage, talk about two exciting facility replacement projects. Uh, talk about one of my favorite things at Rifkas is deferred maintenance issues and some challenges and some opportunities. And I promise when I get to deferred maintenance, we won't go on and on for a while because that's something. So um, the 2007 JPA states that the jurisdictions are responsible for providing the library authority with buildings to operate. There are 28 total facilities in the system, 12 of which are in the city of Sacramento and 16 county locations. And the 16 county locations include the incorporated and unincorporated parts of the county. We have a service area of almost 1,000 square miles as depicted in this map. And just a little bit of a factoid, we are also the fourth largest library jurisdiction in California. So in terms of responsibilities for the buildings, uh, the building owners, the jurisdictions are responsible for all capital improvements. This means major building repairs and replacements as well as all capital repairs. And here are some examples, roofing, HVAC, plumbing. And then there's this ambiguous uh, language that says other elements. And we'll talk about that in a while, but that's truly deferred maintenance. Now the authority itself, we're responsible for janitorial, landscaping, routine, matri routine, matri routine maintenance, such as a broken window or damage that incurred to the facility as a result of patron use. And we're also responsible for security. 
So we provide security guards and we also provide security cameras. So to simplify our responsibilities, if you take the library building, you shake it, you turn it upside down, everything that falls out is the responsibility of the library. Everything else is the responsibility of the jurisdiction. Now, our system-wide square footage is actually fairly interesting. So total system-wide, we have 460,000 square feet. Now you may think that's a lot, but actually compared to some of our other peer libraries, we have very little square footage. Now I'm not saying that's a bad thing because we do a great job with the square footage that we have, but there are some opportunities for improvement. So city branches are approximately about 290,000 square feet. County branches are 165,000 square feet. Comparatively, the central library city location is 160,000 square feet. So one building in the city almost has all the total square library square footage that we have in the county. Another interesting fact, 63% of our system square footage and 40% of the budget is in the city. So there's some very interesting when, when you look at our square footage comparatively and some of the challenges that we have. So I wanna talk, quickly talk about two exciting library facility proposals. I know I'm excited about them and others are, and that's Elk Grove Library Replacement and the North Sacramento Hagenwood Library Replacement. Okay, so I grew up in Elk Grove and I remember back in the days when we had a little postage stamp size library. And when we got the brand new library, it was truly wonderful. This facility has served the community well. However, the time has come to look at another location because there are some operational challenges that have made it difficult to operate. One is it's multi-story, so it's a little expensive. Uh, the parking lot is too small. The very first comment card we ever received when it opened was the parking lot's too small. And there's just, there's, there's more patrons that need to use the library than there are parking spaces. Because it's a two-story building, there are some security deficiencies because there's a lot crammed into that space. And so sometimes there's little hidey holes and it's created some issues. One wonderful building, but it really was never meant to be a library and truly the community has outgrown this library. So recently uh, the city of Elk Grove has purchased the old Rite Aid building located on Elk Grove Boulevard. It's 17,000 square foot facility. It's absolutely wonderful. Biggest thing, it uh, has abundant parking. It's what we call a full service library, meaning not only can we provide traditional library services, but we can provide other services such as uh, passport services or any other thing that might be really advantageous to the community. The space is very easily configurable. It's basically one big space. So we have the opportunity to, I think, get in there and do some stuff pretty quickly. Um, it really serves as an anchor building for a part of the block of Elgar Boulevard. They're trying to, to um, kind of rehab a little bit. Opportunity for incredible community rooms, synergies with other organizations there. Current status is, is the city of Elk Grove has entered into purchase and escrow is gonna close in about 30 to 60 days. Funds are needed to be identified for tenant improvements, but we are working with Group 4 Architecture to help um, come up with some high-level concepts, one if the building was fully built out, or two, some other options to quickly move in and to start service. Next project we're really excited about is the North, Hagenwood, um, the North Sacramento Hagenwood Library. So uh, we have reported many times in the past to the board that there are challenges with this facility. Now, it's a 4,000 square foot leased facility. Just because it's 4,000 square feet doesn't mean it's inadequate. Unfortunately, the layout of it does not work. And uh, in addition, it has a lot of infrastructure challenges that makes it very difficult to perform services in there. Uh, one is that we can't operate during COVID. Um, the uh, HVAC system is insufficient. And just the layout of the building doesn't make it possible to have both patrons and other services at the same time. The building is right with problems with bad roof, plumbing. We've had many issues with the landlord. And honestly, it does not meet the community needs. So we have a wonderful opportunity uh, to move North Sacramento uh, Library to the Sacramento News and Review Building right down the street. It's a 17,000 square foot facility of which the library could use between 10, 12, 13,000 square feet of it. But it gives us an opportunity to truly offer the community a library that they deserve. Full service library, everything from dedicated children's room and studies room, maker spaces, community rooms, uh, 
a hub for economic development, we can even relocate part of our mobile services staff to that location to take advantage of other exciting things that are happening on the boulevard and pair our mobile services with those services. So right now, the city of Sacramento has allocated money for the purchase and for the tenant improvements, and it's pending a city approval. So Article 13 of the JPA states that uh, we have to come to the board to ask for permission to operate a building. I'm going to refer you to the staff report, but specifically, if you were to take a look at Exhibit A in the staff report, it basically provides uh, the in-depth key uh, indicators in determining adoption of the library. Let's quickly go over that one and we can talk a little more later. So what's gonna help us drive all of this is we're in the process of, our, of updating our current facilities master plan. And I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to take a look at the existing one. It was created in the early 2000s and it was put, and it was created long before we had an iPhone. And as we know, a lot's changed in technology. People are using us differently. They're bringing in their own devices. So we're in the process of creating a livable, adaptable facilities master plan. Last year, the unincorporated county uh, started their portion of the master plan. They have just finished theirs and we will be starting ours in which we will have you involved. But the master plan helps create a blueprint for us on how to operate our libraries over the next 10 years. And really what do library facilities need to be and service need to be to be able to provide um, library services. And we know the last year with COVID has really made us rethink a lot of our spaces. And so this will be a very interesting process. We'll have you involved and we're hoping to have it completed this year. So there are a couple issues that we need to address. Of course, we have with any buildings and everyone has this issue, it's the challenge of deferred maintenance. The city of Sacramento funds deferred maintenance at $1.41 a square foot versus the county funds it at $9.93 a square foot. Even at $9.93 a square foot, it's not enough. And $1.41, it's a huge disparity. So I'm hoping these are conversations we can have later to talk about these challenges. In looking at reports prepared by the city and the county, um, deferred maintenance needs by the city are estimated ongoing ones are deferred at, or estimated at 3.9 million, the county 5.4, but please note city is probably higher because they did their own internal assessment where the county did an external assessment. So once again, I'm hoping these are issues that we can talk about at a later date, but there are some opportunities. One is we finally were able to do an Orangeville expansion and I know Sue is very excited about that. We're going to be opening the new uh, Orange Bell Library in late summer, early fall. If we can do it earlier, we will. We're doing a really innovative project at Del Paso Heights where we are reinventing the library. We have removed the adult collection. We have purchased a library vending machine with, where the adult collection will be located. So uh, patrons have access to, to check out materials 24-7. We're reconfiguring the space so that we can have technology labs in there as well as meeting spaces. We're removing the magazines, we're replacing it with tablets. It's really gonna be a showcase for technology and really the future of library services. Another opportunity is Oak Park and I'm gonna let Rifka talk about that one here in a few minutes. But Oak Park hasn't had libraries since 1980. And I think we have an opportunity to do some, some really interesting things. Colonial Heights is on a huge piece of property. There's an opportunity to expand it, do daycare, maybe even housing. I know that uh, Chair Guerra has some really interesting ideas about that. And then there's Martin Luther King Jr. Library. The library is over 50 years old and it is the only city location that has not had a refresh. It is due and, we, and the library deserves it as does the community. Of course, with all opportunities comes a couple challenges. Uh, LK McClatchy Library, beautiful home, but as a library, we labor to provide service in it. For the communities that it's intended to serve, it's geographically isolated. And in addition, there's a lot of building issues with it as well. So I think that's a discussion we need to have in the future. Uh, just keep on your horizon, uh, Cortland, uh, the school district is having financial problems and there's been discussion about possibly closing the campus that we're co-located on. That could be a challenge for us. And of course, the three newest libraries, which are already over 10 years old, North Antonomas, Pocket, and Valley High, 
have experienced severe infrastructure failures, HVAC and roof. We're going to have to really take a look at that. And then Central Library, which I will talk about a, an interesting opportunity for the future. There's many issues to address there, and uh, we'll have a little more discussion about it. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Rifka talk about the next one. Okay. So Oak Park has not had a library. And by the way, we went back and did a little bit of uh, a little bit of investigation about the history of libraries in the city of Sacramento. And while I won't go into it, and it's, this is not meant to chastise anyone because whoever made these decisions is probably no longer even on the planet, but there has been a history of closing libraries where they are needed most. One is in Oak Park. One was the Fruit Ridge uh, in the Fruit Ridge area. Uh, I know some of this had to do with even the Hagenwood Library. The North Sacramento Hagenwood Library is so named because there was once upon a time a Hagenwood Library that was closed um, when the city annexed it. But in Oak Park, one idea that we have is perhaps, and this, and and we want to credit uh, Council Member Chenier for really trying to get libraries in Oak Park. And it just never quite, uh, never quite materialized. This is a tiny library. The image that you're seeing is actually in Meridian, Idaho. It's a container, and it's a library that that while small is mighty. It offers uh, resources designed specifically for children, and we want to explore either a, a, a single or double wide container and actually offers some sort of library service, perhaps uh, adjacent to the community center or in another location that is willing to share uh, share space with us. We we work, tried to work with uh, Father Keith P. Kenny Elementary School on new, numerous occasions, but um, having a library they felt was too disruptive. This could work. We would love to explore it. We're just planting the seed today. We really see this as an opportunity to build equity for a community that needs and deserves library services that we have not been able to provide through a location. Go ahead, Jared. It's your turn. Okay. So finally, I want to talk about the Central Library real quick. So as you know, uh, last year we had two critical Blackwater floods that basically destroyed 60% of the lower level. Within the last 40 days, we have had a uh, failed uh, main water pump. We have had failed water pumps. I'm going to start failed fire suppression pumps. Um, the list goes on and on. The Central Library uh, really suffers from lack of maintenance for over 20 years. And not only that, you know, back when the library was the Central Library was built, great idea for the time, but the space really, we, we labor to provide service in it. So as everybody is aware, the um, Sears has moved out of Arden Fair Mall. And it just happens that the Sears square footage is pretty comparable to the current Central Library at 160,000 square feet. Unlike Central that has five floors, it has three usable floors. And it might be an opportunity for us to think about what could library services be in the future, especially for a Central Library. Sears building is great. Multi, it has large usable footprint, lots of free parking. It has a garage that is critical for us as we are expanding our mobile services fleet. And soon we'll have two all electric bookmobiles, close to public transportation. And it's actually moving the library to where there is huge need. It could also be an opportunity to have a joint use city county facility that could serve both areas. So. That's just something to think about as we look, you know, as we look forward. And we're going to be exploring some of these concepts in the facilities master plan as well. So I know over the last 12, 15 minutes or so, I've kind of thrown a lot at you, but I do appreciate your time with this. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Great, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me uh, before we move on there, uh, let me ask if there's any comments from the public from the clerk. Yes, we have Pat Sarah Handley, president of the North Sac Friends. Great. Well, let's take the public comment first, and then we'll take bring it back to the board. Hi, 
Um, yes, I am the president of the Friends of the North Sacramento Hagenwood Library. And it was about over 25 years ago that uh, our library was flooded and uh, they combined the uh, little library that we had with Hagenwood. And this was supposed to be a temporary storefront facility that is supposed to serve 64,000 people who um, many are low income. A large percentage are below the poverty level. We do service in book first all the uh, schools in our area. So this is a real challenge for the library system to be equitable. We lack computers. Right now, well, it isn't even open, but uh, when it was opened, <laughs> people would just have to wait as compared to uh, other libraries. There was such a lack of space. Um, we wanted to have a continuing education program, but we had no community room. There was a request for a first five preschool, no space again. We wanted to have a pet assistance program. This was canceled because we had no parking. Um, we have zero space for the friends. We're gonna have our spring book giveaway this coming Monday at the Potter's House on Del Paso Boulevard and the books are in my shed. Um, all of, uh, well, I really believe that libraries are the heart of a community. And right now, I don't feel it's equitable. Our library uh, is way too small. Um, I know that a number of people have been really helpful in our quest. I truly want to thank Angelique Ashby, Sean Lalowy, Andy Hernandez, and the many, many people in our community who have supported the expanded library. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate that. And uh, very, very exciting here, you know, on this, uh, this North Sac library. And uh, I, I was also proud to make the motion on the city's budget to move this budget item forward and start that as well. I think there's going to be many hands in this. We have a long speakers list here. So let me uh, bring it back to the board. I'm going to go with uh, here, board member Lalowy, Ashby, Farmer, Vang, then, then is it Kitts? Yeah, we'll go there. So board member Lalowy. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and um, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful report. Um, I am um, a big, big supporter of libraries. Um, I think, you know, going to college, the library was actually my first home, and then my dorm was my second home. Uh, it was an area that I felt safe. I got things done. And I like to um, think that the A's that I received are for the times that I studied in the library and the B's that I received are the times that I decided to sit in Starbucks and uh, do my studying, let alone the C's, but we don't want to talk about the C's. Um, I do believe that North Sacramento is in, uh, in need of a uh, library. So I want to thank um, the city on um, setting aside the, the funding for the new library. As far as the site goes, um, there is one site that uh, it's been in talk with in talks. However, um, there's potentially uh, another site that uh, we've showed some interest in that we think it's going to bring a lot of a lot more equity to our uh, district, especially uh, for our uh, students who um, attend um, Grant High School or Norwood Junior High and uh, um, uh, Taylor Elementary School. So I'm very excited um, um, with our what plans we have in the in the very near future to identify a location that will definitely um, um, help our community, especially in the areas that we are really really underserved. So uh, thank you very much um, for that presentation. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, board member Ashby, Farmer, uh, Van Kitts. Uh, then I saw Cerna pop up as well, too. Thanks. I just uh, wanted to say good work. This is a, a long process. We've been working on this actually 
started with the council member before Mr. Lolohi and with the mayor and uh, and really with the mayor before this mayor too, that this has always been an area where we really uh, felt the need for enhanced library services and investment in the community. I can't say it any better than Pat did, but I've been a part of many conversations with folks from the North area who have said, oh, if only we had more space. And I know the volunteers out there in in Councilmember Lolohi's district have books in their garages and uh, play toys and first five things in their garages because they're trying to be the storage unit for an inadequate library. And there's probably very few places we could find in the region that need these services and resources more than the boulevard. So I am happy to continue working on this item. And Mr. Lolohi is quite fortunate. He has multiple locations in his district that are shovel ready, we could start tomorrow on them. So we did, we will uh, pursue that. And I hope everyone will support this, this item today. I'm not sure if Mr. Lolo, we made a motion there. Did, did you make a motion, Sean? Um, no, but I thank you for reminding me. I, I, <laughs> I like to make a motion to uh, move this forward. Okay, uh, it's then been I, properly moved. All right, and I will second council member Lolo's motion proudly and my commitment to you pat is to all stay engaged here and i will continue to support council member lolo we have a really good champion in him he's already made it clear that this library is the top priority for him we're gonna get you a timeline and we'll get moving quickly so thanks to everyone and thanks to all the members of this library authority that have been so great in helping push this project forward for the north area we're really really proud and i can't wait to stand out there with all of you and and uh, cut a ribbon all right. Well, it's been properly moved and seconded. Now we'll move on to board member Farmer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a, I just had one question regarding the presentation that um, that Jared, uh, well, actually it was Jared and Rivka both gave, but regarding the, um, the rendering of the small uh, library, like the mini library, I guess with the containers. Um, I don't know if that was, something that was being thrown around is for some of the areas i guess you mentioned like oak park and some others that don't have something maybe this is something you guys you guys are looking at is that is that something is that is, did i read that right yes you did okay. we we we're, we got very excited when we learned about this library and um we want to explore it and and see because we've been looking at how much it costs to buy a container and retrofit it and we'll be developing some plans and it may actually uh, meet some needs in some underserved areas also in the county so we're kind of excited so so my question was is it and i again i apologize for my um my lack of knowledge specifically with the area but let's just talk about like oak park for example that area um, I don't know what I do see a lot in a lot of urban areas now is there's a lot of, you know, commercial real estate that's empty in some areas. And I just thought that isn't it, isn't it still econo more economical to find an empty space that's already, you know, uh, needs little work to make into a library. I mean, maybe already has an existing restroom or other facilities that a container. And I mean, is the container with the container be put onto city property? So there's no need to have, you know, the purchase of real estate is not, I'm just trying to understand how that it's, it's, it looks like a cool idea. I'm just trying to understand if that's really like a cheaper alternative than, than just getting a space that's already kind of empty. I, I don't know, maybe educate me a little bit on that. No, this is great. This is exactly the kind of discussion that we need to be having moving forward. And, you know, again, the, the, the Oak Park Library was closed in the 80s because the building was sold to McGeorge School of Law. There's a park right next door to the McGeorge School of Law. Mm -hmm. So it's there's some potential. It's called McClatchy Park, but there is some potential for, I think, exploring all of these options. Of course, my dream is always that the owner of a commercial space will come forward and say, you know what? Commercial real estate's going to, you know, heck in a handbasket. How about putting a library in our space? Because we have some ideas for, um, especially in the uh, down in the Elk Grove area, uh, to serve that west side. It would be that would actually be a solution. So anyway, um, I think these are great questions, and we have to discuss them and figure okay. out a what we can afford, 
and B, where's the best place that will serve the public? Okay, that makes sense. I, I, and and uh, and again, I see that if it's going to go all, you know, it's just a one and done. You the cost of the purchase of the container and the retrofitting and all that, and then there's of course only to, only ongoing maintenance at that point. But there's no lease payment, there's no rent. So I get how that would be cheaper. But I also think that like even even if it was a double container, I think one important key with the library is not just about renting or uh, uh, you know the availability of books, but it's like. Um, it's like uh, Mr. Lololi say said, you know, people go and they actually sit in the library and they, they actually, you know, it's a place they go to do things and stuff. So I, I believe that it's important to have an adequate space to do that too. So I don't know if the mini, if the mini thing is going to fill that need, but anyway, so I, I just, again, not under, new to this conversation here. I just wanted to ask those questions. My other comment was about the North um, Sacramento location. I, I, you know, I received a lot of emails as all of us did. Um, a lot of people um, very supportive of that. So I just wanted to say thank you to all the emails um, that we've received for all those people that are passionate to support that. It sounds uh, not really knowing the area. I apologize, I don't, but it sounds like there's clearly a need and there's, it seems like a lot of people very, very excited about it. So just want to say thank you to those people that, that took the time to write emails for that. So thank you. That's all I have. Great. Thank you very much, board member Farmer. And yes, I think there, uh, the presentation that Jared pointed out is that there's a lot of conversation about the overall library master plan, and including the idea, as you mentioned, if we own the land, could we do things innovative like building both housing and childcare as part of it to create, uh, maximize our, our best uh, usage there. So great. Let's moving on. We'll go to board member Vang and then, uh, uh, and then Serna. Looks like uh, board member gets uh, pulled their hand down. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chair Guetta. Uh, so first, Jared, thank you so much for your very thorough presentation. Really appreciate it, especially as a newbie on the Public Library Authority Board. I'm really excited also to see that the resident of North Sac will be getting a new library. And I just want to take this moment to thank Councilwoman Angelique Ashby for her years of advocacy to, to make this happen. Um, me too. I, you know, I think uh, Councilmember Sean Lowley mentioned about how public libraries was uh, really a safe space for him growing up. Uh, someone who is a Sacramento native, the two libraries that I went to was Colonial Heights and also MLK Library. Um, and so, you know, um, Rifka, I really appreciate you putting uh, MLK Library on there as an opportunity because that is definitely one of my top priorities um, in that area. And particularly, MLK Library is truly in the heart of South Sacramento, serving a lot, many of our low income families. Um, the library in itself, um, it's next to a senior housing apartment, it's next to Capital City, which is an alternative school. And there are several vacant lots um, in that area as well. And that library uh, gives a lot of hope to that community. And so I'm really looking forward to, to, to figuring out um, the opportunities and what we can do to really uh, retrofit that library or expand it. Um, I did have one question, though, in particular regarding the master plan uh, facilities for the city. I understand that the county is completed and wanted to kind of understand kind of the timeline for community outreach so that we can really ensure uh, that we're in alignment with community needs and vision uh, for services and just the space. So if someone can share a little bit about that, that would be great. So as you know, COVID has presented quite a few challenges to us this, this time with actually doing traditional outreach. So um, we have been working internally and um, coming up with a plan to have to do it both virtually and then to be able to safely do some forms of traditional community outreach where we can actually have people gather as we progress through the tiers and we're allowed to do it. So I believe, um, and Rifka, please feel free to join in the timeline. I think we're looking at around June uh, timeframe to start with uh, more of our um, in-depth outreach to the community and try to have some sort of community open forums where they can actually uh, weigh in on what do you want to see in your libraries and even more so what does the community need so that's our timeline and, and we can provide that to the board in the next board report and, and i'll just add that uh, for those who are are new to the board we spent uh, most of 2019 doing community conversations we did 83 throughout the library district um, and it was really not about what do you want from the library. It was really about what do you want? Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, people said, I want to feel safe. I want to feel connected. And we, you know, we can, while we cannot always guarantee safe, safety, as we 
tragically learned, we can guarantee connection in our libraries. And we want to move that forward as well and make sure that uh, that the public has a, the opportunity to really let us know what would most serve their needs. So again, a tiny library may not be the best choice, but it's better than no library at all. I mean, I, I'm looking at it as the half a loaf, for example, but we see this as an opportunity over the next to, to start the work, to make sure that we're reaching families and teens, especially, we need their feedback on what they, they want from the library. So those are the kinds of things. So stay tuned. We're going we're gonna to make this happen and uh, happen fast. That's great, Rivka. And I, um, I'm sure my staff is watching this because they watch me at these public meetings. I don't want to put more work on their plate, but I definitely want to be a liaison in that work uh, on the city end uh, to help lead that effort to make sure that we um, we get as much input and feedback from the community in the city of Sacramento. Um, so thank you so much for your work, and I uh, would love to to partner with you and and help in any way that I can on that. Thank you. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, board member uh, Cerna, Cerna here, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thanks to um, our staff uh, for the insightful uh, facilities update. Um, had a question, um, I guess it's for, for Rivka. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'm hoping you can confirm that there is such thing as a library shed. In other words, uh, where we play, where we cite our libraries relative to other libraries is done in a in a in a way where you don't over concentrate. You try and geographically make you know make it equitable across a, an area. But the the question is, is that does that shed um, shrink and expand based on the size of the facility? Um, and the reason I ask the question is, um, you're you're probably very well aware of the um, renaissance that the uh, Fruit Ridge Community Collaborative has enjoyed over the last several years. And I've been front and center with that effort uh, repurposing the former Fruit Ridge Elementary School. But of course it is um, on a map, you look at a map and it is very close to Colonial Heights, but um, I don't know what the, the usage patterns are for that unincorporated portion of South Oak Park and the residents there and you know in terms of you know how frequently they use the Colonial Heights Library could we if the sensitivity to uh, that location to, to Colonial Heights is not as great as I think it might be could you do something like the container idea at the Fruit Ridge Community Collaborative that could serve that part of, of Oak Park um, it's it's one of the things that um, I think we need to exhaust in terms of um, how we consider serving uh, that part of the, the city and the county. Um, and then lastly, I, I want to um, also uh, share my thanks to all the uh, library supporters and the Woodlake neighborhood activists uh, who uh, emailed us in support of um, uh, the uh, uh, relocation of the, the uh, North Sacramento Library to the um, uh, News and Marie's View building. I, I think it's a wonderful location uh, and I will be supporting the motion. But Rivka, if you could if you could address uh, some of my questions, comments relative to the, the shed and the scale um, idea, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer the, the scale part of the question as well as uh, Jared probably can, but I will tell you that group four who's working with us on the master on the master plan did indicate to us that actually most of our libraries are pretty well placed. The where the where we have a concentration that maybe needs to be looked at is is literally the downtown area because you've got central, you've got McClatchy, and you have McKinley, and it's basically a triangle, and each one is about two miles apart. And there's great public transportation, obviously, for Central, uh, not quite as much for the others. But in terms of your other question, that Colonial Heights area is near and dear to my heart because of my kids. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those areas that's ripe because nobody knows if they're in the city and the county. You just have to know that the white signs are county and the green signs are city, right? And I love that cooperative. I, I serve on the Slow Food Board, and when we can meet in person, that's where we meet. That's the kind of 
place where we could actually consider doing a tiny library that maybe is specialized. The mm -hmm. one in Meridi Meridian, Idaho that we showed you is for children ages zero to five. So we could look at that. Where are, the, where are the areas of need where maybe there are teens that we want to create at least a place where they can pick up books mm -hmm. and maybe spend a little bit of time? Um, those kinds of things. I love that question because while we are well-placed, we are our libraries are where our libraries are, the existing ones. So it, this is an opportunity to look at where the need is and to rethink. The old master plan was looking at libraries that averaged 35,000 square feet. We couldn't operate a library of that size with our current funding levels. Probably, I mean, it would be very challenging that 15,000 square foot library as a maximum size for a branch is the sweet, is the sweet spot. And, um, and, and Jared says that to us all the time. And I, in the, in the interest of time, I removed a slide that would have shown that to you, but, but it was, it's a great question. And I think we have to explore those things. What does the community need? How do we build equity and what's the most expedient way to do that? So I'm so glad you asked that question because that in particular is a perfect space because it is city county right yeah i mean <clears throat> literally the uh, the school site is surrounded on four sides by the unincorporated county right um well i'd like to to offer to uh convene a, a further discussion um with uh with you and your staff rifka and uh, obviously someone the right person probably the facilities director from sac unified uh, who obviously owns the property uh, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, you know the school well, you know the site well. Um, you, we could lo locate a container, probably locate a couple of containers if we wanted to. Um, in fact, when we opened up the Birth and Beyond Center uh, there, we did it with the uh, cooperation and participation with the school district who was able to provide two of the, the portables. And we, we put those together and that became the, the main office for Birth and Beyond there. So um, I, I would very much like us to not lose sight of this, this opportunity. Thank you. We look forward to that. Thank you very much, uh, Board Thanks. Member Cerna. And, and, I, and, I'll, and I'd love to join you on that effort, too. I think you know, I, I live uh, on the other side of Stockton Boulevard near Colonial Heights Library. And, um, you know, crossing Stockton Boulevard, you might as well be crossing a large river sometimes. So I think uh, there makes, it makes sense to look at what kind of added support we can do at the Fruit Ridge Collaborative there. Okay, thank, moving on here, uh, Sue, uh, Board Member Frost. Thank you, Chair Gerda. Uh, I just wanted to say that I realize now more than ever, uh, already realized how lucky we were to, to get the expanded library in Orangevale and appreciated the board's support on that. I definitely support um, this and the idea of exploring opportunities. And I just want to underscore the the fact that the whole reason we were able to finally figure out how to make something happen with Orangevale um, and for those of you who don't realize don't know Orangevale was a, a library expansion in a leased building we had plans for a new 15 million dollar library but there was no funding for it and the reason we were able to do it was through the lease uh, opportunity because we didn't have the cash for the new library. And so um, there are sometimes there's different ways to get things done. And I think it's, it's so important. The libraries are so important to the communities. Um, so if we can find a way to support them, we should. And I do. And I um, thank you for your out of the box thinking to Rivka and all the staff on this. I'm, I'm, I support it and I'm excited. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Board Member Frost, and thank you for being an advocate for expanding the library on the east end of the county there as well. Okay, Board Member Jennings. Uh, thank you, Chair Guerra. Um, I will be supporting this motion as well, and I want to thank um, the for the presentation today um, because this brought a whole lot to, to each and every one of us. And um, you know, I wish I had known council member Laloi's secret in college because I definitely would have improved my GPA. Um, so I missed out on that one, but uh, we wanna make sure other kids who are growing up now will not miss out on that. 
Um, I, I, I just know that uh, some of us are heavily invested in uh, area of Sacramento or the, the city or the county. And for me, it's Oak Park uh, because I've been going to church in Oak Park since 1986. I started working in Oak Park in 1992. Um, I'm heavily invested in Oak Park with the Oak Ridge and the uh, Father Keith V. Kenny School right now. So for me, um, not having a library in Oak Park is personal because it's one of the areas that needs it the most and yet we don't have it. And so I, I'm willing to invest my time and energy and effort to bringing all the, the players together in Oak Park to see what can be done in Oak Park in some form, form of a partnership that allows us to get some form of a library there now and also plan for what we want that library to look like over the next 10 to 15 years. So today it might be a container uh, tomorrow, it might be something else. And so I'm willing to do that. And I'm sure others are willing to do that as well for certain areas that they're heavily invested in. Uh, and I see the nodding of the head. So that's a good thing. But uh, I'm heavily invested right now. I'm, I'm in favor of moving this forward and getting involved in correcting a wrong that needs to be corrected immediately. So um, I want to make sure we do this together. So my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Board Member Jennings, and uh, completely agree with you on that aspect uh, uh, and would like to continue to support those efforts. Uh, circling back here, Board Member Ashby. Or did you just have your hand uh, still up there? I didn't, I did not re-raise my hand, but thank you oh, okay. for thinking of me. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that concludes all the comments of the board. Um, and a very exhaustive conversation here. I'm, I'm sure when we start discussing the master plan, the library master plan, we should probably add another hour to our uh, agenda there. So um, with that, Madam Clerk, I guess we'll call the roll here. Angelique Ashby. An enthusiastic yes. Bobby Singh Allen. She had to uh, leave to uh, get prepared yeah. for the city today. Don Natoli. Aye. Eric Guetta. Aye. Garrett Gatewood. Aye. Congratulations, guys. Kevin Spees. Aye. Mai Vang. Yes. Patrick Kennedy. Aye. Phil Cerna. Aye. Rick Jennings. An enthusiastic and heartfelt yes. Sean Lolloway? Yes. Sean Farmer? Yes. Sue Frost? Aye. Tim Schaefer? Absolutely, yes. Saul Hernandez? Yes. And the motion passed with 14 members present. Great. Well, thank you very much. Exciting conversation here. All right, so Madam Clerk, moving on to our uh, last item here on the agenda, reports, ideas, questions from the board. Seeing none, want to thank everyone here. Have a happy Thursday. And uh, that means we're on item nine. We're adjourned at 4.30 p.m. All right, thank you to all our city staff and everyone who came in for the public for their comments, and we'll see each other soon. All the best, everybody. Good Thanks meeting. Good meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good you. Job, Stay healthy. Thank you. Yes.